We're going to change tunes here and talk about something other than cancer. We'll talk about poisonings and intoxications. These are my disclosures. Okay, so this is the outline for today. Well, I'll start off by giving you a, a case presentation of a, of a patient who's intoxicated. We'll then talk about the management of the poison patient, and then I'll transition into some of the classic intoxication syndromes, which you um, may see on the boards. So this is a patient that we saw um, uh, during my fellowship year, and I'll share that with you. It was a 37-year-old man who had no prior medical history. He was found unresponsive and tachypnic at work. Um, they called 911, and he was uh, brought to the emergency room where he was intubated. And in the initial evaluation was uh, to make sure he didn't have a stroke. So they did a CT scan, and that was negative. And then when they drew his labs, they noted that he had a severe anion gap metabolic acidosis, and they consulted nephrology. So just a little bit more information about the patient. Reportedly, he was only taking Tylenol as needed. He had no allergies. His physical exam, he was tachycardic, hypertensive. Uh, he was on oxygen already at this point. Um, his exam showed p equal and round pupils that were reactive. Uh, his heart was regular rate and rhythm. His lungs were clear. And the rest of his exam was relatively unremarkable. However, as you can see, his labs were not unremarkable. He had a very severe metabolic acidosis with a bicarbonate of 7. His creatinine was elevated at 1.6, which reportedly was normal about a month prior to this. His lactic acid level was 1.8. Serum and urine toxicology screens were negative. As you can see, his ABG showed a pH of 6.9 with a PCO2 of 16. He had a serum osmolality of 330. That was the measured osmolality. And his UA showed a little bit of protein, some blood, and what were reported as some hyperic acid crystals. In the emergency room, the patient developed uh, tachyarrhythmias and became hypotensive. He was then admitted to the ICU where he had, a car he had a cardiac arrest and died only seven hours after his presentation to the emergency room. Afterwards, um, the renal fellow, who wasn't me at the time, um, take, took a look at the urine sediment and noticed an abundance of calcium oxalate crystals. And hours afterwards, he was found to have an ethylene glycol level quite elevated at 131.6 milligrams per deciliter. So this case really highlights the morbidity and mortality associated with poisonings and intoxications in this country and around the world. In 2014, there was an annual report of the American Association of Poison Control Centers, which documented just over 2 million human exposure cases, of which a little over 1,000 were fatal. Almost 2,500 exposures were treated with hemodialysis, and about 43 exposures were treated with hemoperfusion. And we'll talk about these modalities uh, throughout this talk. Just to give you an idea of what sort of exposures or toxins are responsible for a lot of these, um, these cases, topping the list are analgesics, followed by sedatives, hypnotics, and antipsychotics, and antidepressants in third place. Uh, you can see household cleaning substances, alcohols are up there, pesticides as well. So the initial management of the poison patient should really focus on strong supportive care. This is really the only thing that's been shown to improve clinical outcomes. That means, you know, checking ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation, making sure that the patient has, patient has a pain airway, is uh, having good respirations. If there's any um, impairment to this, patients should be intubated. So anyone who comes in with an altered mental status, respiratory distress, uh, really should be intubated. Patients who present with altered mental status should receive oxygen, naloxone, uh, dextrose, as well as thiamine. And the key here that you want to remember is that if you have any suspicion that a patient might have thiamine deficiency, let's just say they have a history of alcohol consumption, for instance, you want to give them the thiamine before you give the dextrose, and this is meant to prevent the development of uh, Wernicke's encephalopathy. Once you've, uh, once you've stabilized the patient, the next step is to decontaminate the patient. And there are three different ways that we can go about doing this. Uh, we can either uh, decontaminate the patient or try to remove the toxin through the GI tract, and this includes such things as gastric emptying, gastric lavage, uh, activated charcoal, cathartics. There's also renal elimination, and these, this includes urinary alkalinization or forced diuresis, or extracorporeal methods, which include hemodialysis and hemoperfusion. We're going to talk mostly about the renal methods as well as the extracorporeal methods. So the first form of renal elimination we'll talk about is urinary alkalinization. And the principle behind urinary alkalinization is that 
many toxic compounds um, are weak acids or bases, which means that in the blood, they exist in both the intact acid form as well as the ionized form, of, uh, which includes the, the anion or the cation, depending whether it's an acid or a base. And the, the proportion of the acid that, or the base which exists in its ionized form depends on both the pKa of the compound as well as the pH of the solution, which is the plasma or the urine. And if you are able to manipulate the pH of the urine, for instance, to favor the ionized form, which is lipid insoluble, uh, water soluble, and you can actually trap the compound in the, the lumen of the tubule and prevent it from crossing over across the, uh, the renal epithelium, preventing it from being reabsorbed and thus improving its urinary excretion. Now, in order for this strategy to be effective, the renal excretion of this particular compound has to be sufficient to make it increasing the clearance of that substance through the, the, uh, the urine, a major route of elimination. So there are certain drugs that are more likely to respond to urinary alkalinization. They have these following characteristics. They're typically uh, primarily excreted unchanged by the kidney. They're primarily distributed in the extracellular fluid compartments. They're minimally protein bound. And as I mentioned, they tend to be weak acids with a pKa of between 3 and 7.5. Probably the most common drugs that you'll see um, urinary alkalinization used for are, are salicylates, uh, phenobarbital, and phenobarbital is the only barbiturate for which this actually works because most of the other barbiturates are eliminated by the liver as opposed uh, by, to the, by the kidney, and chlorpropamide, which we don't see that much anymore. So prior to urinary alkalinization, you'll want to obtain baseline electrolytes, BUN, creatinine levels, um, both the blood and the urine pH, as well as the drug concentration levels. A recommended um, method for, for administering urinary, urinary alkalinization would be to give a patient a bolus of sodium bicarbonate, one to two mil equivalents per kilogram intravenously over an hour, followed by a continuous infusion um, at 200 to 250 cc's an hour. And you want to adjust the infusion rate to try to achieve a urine pH greater than 7.5 while trying to prevent the patient from becoming too alkalemic, so trying to keep the, the serum pH uh, less than 7.6. Now, there are some potential complications to urinary alkalinization. Uh, you can uh, cause alkalemia to the patient, which can cause uh, uh, cardiac issues. Patients can become hypokalemic as you alkalinize the serum. This leads to the um, shifting of potassium from the inside of the cell out into the extracellular fluid compartment. Patients can develop ionized hypocalcemia as the alkalemia causes shifts in the percentage proportion of bound and unbound calcium. And of course, if you're giving patients sodium bicarbonate, the patients can develop volume overload from the sodium load. In addition to uh, urinary alkalinization, there's also forced saline diuresis. So these are patients whom you're going to give um, uh, an infusion of sodium chloride to try to volume expand the patient. And this helps to increase urinary flow rate. And it's helpful in patients um, who have ingested a substance that, whose excretion is highly dependent on your GFR. And it's also helpful in patients who uh, present with volume contraction, such as those who, um, who overdose on lithium. Here are some of the agents which are, 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 are for which forced saline diuresis are com is commonly used. You can see that chemotherapeutic agents, for one, um, are often administered with uh, a lot of IV fluids for this particular reason to increase the, the renal clearance. And lithium is the other one that you want to think about um, uh, to administer forced saline diuresis. So let's move on to the extracorporeal methods of elimination. Now, hemodialysis is usually not indicated in the removal of most poisons and, and, and toxins. However, there are certain toxins for which hemodialysis might be uh, clinically useful. And here's some of the characteristics of toxins which can be removed well by hemodialysis. These substances usually have a low molecular weight, less than 300 Daltons. They have a, a small volume of distribution within the body. They're generally water-soluble. They have low protein binding and they rapidly equilibrate between the tissue and the blood compartments within the body. This is just a table of some of the drugs uh, and toxins that have, uh, are common, commonly removed by hemodialysis or efficiently removed by hemodialysis. Lithium and ethylene glycol are, are the most common drugs that have been uh, removed by hemodialysis over the last 20 years. You can see that these drugs have very similar characteristics. They have very relatively low molecular weights. Their volume of distribution is, is also pretty low, and they're all water-soluble. 
So if you're going to do hemodialysis to remove a toxin or a poison, you're going to want to choose a, a high efficiency, high flux dialyzer if possible. Now patients who present with intoxications are often unstable and they might be hypotensive and things you want to consider, you may, these patients might need saline infusions, uh, cool dialysate, possibly the administration of vasoconstrictors while they're receiving dialysis. A lot of them will come in with metabolic abnormalities and acid base disturbances, so you want to adjust your dialysate composition accordingly, uh, particularly the potassium and the bicarbonate concentrations. Heparin anticoagulation should be given unless contraindicated. And there's a particular situation where you want to think about this, and that's in methanol poisoning, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And the reason for this is because patients who uh, overdose on methanol are at risk for developing cerebral hemorrhage. And so you do not want to give these patients anticoagulation given the risk of worsening or precipitating that. And, and some of these patients are hypophosphatemic and should get uh, phosphorus supplementation. Hemoperfusion is the other form of extracorporeal therapy, and the, um, the mechanism for this is a little bit different. Again, you use a hemodialysis machine, but instead of a dialyzer, you use these hemoperfusion cartridges, which are packed with charcoal or, um, or another type of sorbent, which is surrounded by a thin, porous, semi-permeable membrane. And what happens here is that the charcoal in the cartridge actually competes with plasma proteins for the drugs um, that you're trying to eliminate. These char this charcoal will absorb the drug and, as in essence, eliminate it from circulation. And the advantage to hemoperfusion is that it may be more efficient than hemodialysis at removing drugs or toxins that are lipid-soluble or protein-bound. Here's a table just showing you some of the drugs for which hemoperfusion may be effective at removing them. Uh, theophylline, and carbamazepine, uh, disopyramide, phenobarbital, and phenytoin. As you can see, the, um, these are larger substances in terms of the molecular weight. Most of them are not water-soluble. So there are some disadvantages to hemoperfusion. Probably the, the greatest disadvantage is that uh, hemoperfusion is not widely available in most centers and most hospitals in this country. There was a study that came out, uh, I think, Kidney International in the mid-2000s, which showed that in the city of New York, there were only three hospitals in the entire city that were actually equipped to do hemoperfusion. So you can imagine even a large metropolitan area that there aren't that many centers that can actually perform this, this technique. It's even more limited in other parts of the country. So availability is a big disadvantage. The other thing is that the, in, uh, in contrast to hemodialysis or dialysis membranes, uh, these hemoperfusion cartridges can actually become saturated and they can lose their efficiency over time. Also in contrast to dialysis, hemoperfusion does nothing to ameliorate acute kidney injury or any of the metabolic or electrolyte disturbances that can happen in patients who come in with these intoxications. Some patients can develop thrombocytopenia, and this is because platelets can actually bind to the surface of the hemoperfusion cartridges. It's generally a transient process and resolves within 24 to 48 hours after the hemoperfusion is completed. Patients generally require a little bit more heparin with hemoperfusion than with hemodialysis, and some of the hemoperfusion cartridges actually have to be primed with dextrose for an hour or two before the procedure can actually begin, so this may cause a delay in the institution of this, uh, this modality. So I've just put this table in for your reference. It just uh, shows some of the different properties um, and indications for when you'd want to use hemodialysis, hemoperfusion, and just compares and contrasts the two. So it's just, uh, just for your reference. And this is just another reference table for you, again, showing some of the most common drugs for which uh, extracorporeal methods are used, the concentration of which these drugs above which you may want to consider uh, using either hemodialysis or hemoperfusion, and which modality is preferred. There are some drugs and toxins which are, are not amenable to extracorporeal treatments. Um, for instance, tricyclic antidepressants are not well removed by either of these methods. One of the reasons is because they have a high volume of distribution in the body. They're also highly lipid soluble. As I mentioned, short-acting barbiturates, um, because these are metabolized by the liver. Acetaminophen. Uh, narcotics and some non-barbiturate hypnotic sedatives and tranquilizers. So prior to a few years ago, there were really not that many guidelines um, giving recommendations about when to use hemodialysis or hemoperfusion in patients who are poisoned or intoxicated. And, it, and uh, just about five years ago, this organization was uh, put together called the EXTRIP Work Group, which stands for the Extracorporeal Treatments and Poisoning Work Group. And this is an international panel of experts made up of nephrologists, emergency room physicians, toxicologists, 
and so forth, um, that systematically review the literature and they develop evidence-based recommendations for the use of uh, hemodialysis or hemoperfusion in poisonings. And you, I put the website here that you can um, access you know, off hours to see what the recommendations are. These are actually, they actually published their recommendations in various journals. Some of them have been published in CJSON, for instance. And um, we'll be talking about some of these recommendations as I go on. I think one of the things we have to keep in mind is that the literature in the field about the use of these various modalities in poisonings is quite limited. It's mostly limited to case reports or case series. So it's a tough job for them to have to review this literature and, and basically state that in most cases the quality of the evidence is relatively low, but you know, they do the best with what they have available to them. So let's move into some of the different toxi uh, toxidromes that you might encounter. So we'll start with lithium. So as many of you know, lithium is a, a small monovalent cation that's used to treat mania and bipolar disorder. It has a pretty narrow therapeutic level between 0.6 and 1.5, which increases its uh, risk for toxicity. It's rapidly absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract, and it reaches serum levels relatively quickly within 30 minutes to two hours, at least for the immediate release. The modified release of lithium may take um, a little bit longer, four to five hours to reach peak serum levels. Lithium has a pretty large volume of distribution within the body and it reaches higher concentrations in certain organs, such as the brain, the thyroid, uh, the bones, as well as part, uh, distal tubular cells of the kidney. And lithium is excreted primarily by the kidney. It's freely filtered, and about 80% of, of that freely filtered lithium is, is reabsorbed. The important thing to know is that any factor that increases the reabsorption of sodium in the kidney will also re increase the reabsorption of lithium. So such things as volume depletion from vomiting, diarrhea, the use of diuretics, um, dietary sodium restriction, the use of ACE inhibitors or NSAIDs, all these things can also increase the, the renal reabsorption of lithium. We can divide lithium intoxication into three different categories, acute, acute and chronic, and chronic. So acute lithium intoxication occurs in patients who have, are not normally taking lithium who choose to overdose. In most cases, this is uh, intentional, intentional suicides, for instance. Acute and chronic occurs in patients who are, who are taking lithium on a chronic basis who overdose. And these patients can uh, you know, present either with an accidental or an intentional overdose. And then there are patients who develop chronic lithium intoxication. Again, these patients are taking lithium chronically, but then either as, as a result of a, a dose increase or a decrease in their renal function, they develop super therapeutic levels and develop uh, intoxication. The symptoms of lithium intoxication are, are roughly correlated with the serum levels, although uh, I, it's not an exact science here. Uh, patients who have mild toxicity have uh, more neurological symptoms, lethargy, drowsiness, tremor, weakness. Some have nausea and vomiting. Um, as the serum level rises, the toxicity becomes more moderate. Again, they still have neurological symptoms, confusion, dysarthria. They start to get um, myoclonic twitches as well as EKG changes. In severe toxicity, they can develop impaired consciousness, seizures, syncope, renal dysfunction, and more seriously, coma and death. The treatment of lithium intoxication starts with supportive care, as I mentioned, the ABCs. Uh, gastric elimination is not particularly useful. Activated charcoal, for instance, will do very little against lithium intoxication. Um, the first step you might want to uh, try to do is uh, force saline diuresis especially in patients who are volume depleted. There is some limited evidence suggesting that sodium polystyrene sulfonate or kx -late can be used um, as a binder for lithium. The rationale here is that this, uh, this substance can exchange sodium for lithium. But really the treatment of patients who have very severe lithium poisoning is hemodialysis. And again, there were some recommendations issued by these, this XTRIP work group just a couple of years ago which states here that hemodialysis should be recommended for lithium intoxication in patients who have impaired kidney function and a serum lithium level that's greater than four milliequivalents per liter, or patients who present with a decreased level of consciousness, seizures, or arrhythmias, regardless of the serum lithium level. Now, I will mention that you know, before this, these recommendations were issued, there's, there was no consensus about when to, uh, to start hemodialysis. There were varying levels of lithium within the blood that people would, would use hemodialysis for. But this is what the recommendations were from the extra work group. They, they um, stated that hemodialysis could be suggested if the lithium level was greater than five, if the patient had some confusion, 
or if uh, the expected time to get a lithium level less than one was going to be greater than 36 hours through more supportive measures. The recommendation is to stop dialysis when the lithium concentration reaches uh, less than one in the serum, or if there's clear evidence of clinical improvement in the patients, or if the hospital or, or center is unable to measure lithium levels um, in these patients after a minimum of six hours of hemodialysis. They also recommend that you should check serum, uh, serum lithium levels serially after you complete dialysis, and the reason is because, remember, the lithium has a pretty large volume distribution in the body, and there's a risk for a rebound as some of this lithium re-equilibrates back into the, into the extracellular fluid compartment into the serum. Some patients may require a repeat session of dialysis to remove that rebound in lithium. And uh, the recommendation is in support, uh, prefers the use of intermittent hemodialysis over uh, chronic renal replacement therapy. So let's move on to some of the toxic alcohols. So ethylene glycol is one of the more commonly ones, uh, common ones that you'll see on the boards. Ethylene glycol is a common agent that's found in antifreeze, but it's also found in a number of other household and industrial agents, fire extinguishers, inks, pesticides, air, con air conditioning systems, and so on. Ethylene glycol is rapidly absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract, and it reaches peak levels within just a couple of hours. It's rapidly distributed throughout the body and has a, a high water solubility. And the important thing to remember about ethylene glycol, as well as all the other toxic alcohols, is that it's metabolized by an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. And it's broken down into metabolites, um, which are, are also effectively removed by hemodialysis. So both ethylene glycol and these metabolites are efficiently removed by hemodialysis. You may have already seen this diagram of the uh, metabolism of the toxic alcohols during this course, but I'll just bring it up for review again, just to highlight that, again, the, the initial step of metabolism for all the toxic alcohols is the same and using the same enzyme, this alcohol dehydrogenase. So with ethylene glycol, it's broken down to glycoaldehyde, which is broken down to glycolic acid, the glyoxylic acid down to oxalic acid. And it's really the glycolic acid and the oxalic acid uh, which contribute to the toxicity of ethylene glycol. Notice also that the glyoxylic acid is also broken down into glycine and uh, alpha hydroxy beta keto adipate. Both of these are, are harmless substances. So patients who have an ethylene glycol intoxication have clinical symptoms which evolve over time. So in the early stages of ethylene glycol intoxication, neurologic abnormalities predominate. And this is when patients come in, primarily they have uh, high levels of ethylene glycol in the blood, and most of the symptoms are neurologic. Na um, lethargy, coma, nystagmus, ataxia. Some of them may have some nausea and vomiting. Within 12 to 24 hours, the picture changes and patients start to develop cardiopulmonary dysfunction. And this stage occurs as the ethylene glycol is broken down into its metabolites. Patients may have dyspnea, heart failure, pulmonary edema, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And most fatalities due to ethylene glycol will occur in this second stage. Stage three occurs 24 to 72 hours after the ingestion, and here's where renal dysfunction sets in. And this is when the oxalic acid, uh, the oxalate, starts to crystallize and deposits within the kidney, can cause acute tubular injury, um, can bind calcium and cause hypocalcemia, and some patients will have flank pain. So there are a number of lab abnormalities that are characteristic of ethylene glycol. So for instance, uh, an anion gap metabolic acidosis is pretty common. Patients will often have an osmolal gap. And recall that an osmolal gap is defined as the difference between the calculated and the measured, uh, the difference between the calculated osmolarity and the measured plasma osmolality. A normal osmolal gap should be less than 10. So if you see a patient with an uh, acidosis or an, uh, with an osmolal gap that's greater than 10 or greater than 20, you should definitely be thinking about the possibility of a toxic alcohol ingestion. Uh, patients may have hypocalcemia. If you look in the urine, you may see the presence of oxalate crystals, which I'll show you, um, hyperate crystals, and acute kidney injury uh, is also a common finding. So one thing I want to, to point out is that the osmolar gap and the anion gap actually change in patients who have an ethylene glycol intoxication, and it depends on the time of when the patient takes ingestion. So if you look here, this graph was taken from a paper from C. Jason, you can see that early on, patients have a high osmolar gap, 
but a normal anion gap. And this is because early on, what's present in the blood is the ethylene glycol. The ethylene glycol contributes to the osmolar gap, um, but the ethylene glycol has not yet been metabolized into its metabolites, which are what generate the acidosis. And so early on, osmolar gap is elevated and anion gap is normal. But as time goes on, you can see the osmolar gap decreases as the ethylene glycol is being metabolized, and the anion gap increases as the oxalic acid and the glycolic acid are generated. Now, the oxalic acid and the glycolic acid do not contribute to the osmolar gap, which is why the osmolar gap tends to decrease. And you can see the late presentation, the osmolar gap may be entirely normal, whereas the anion gap can be elevated. So you can see that depending on when the patient actually presents, using the osmolar gap and the anion gap, uh, you have to be really careful about how you interpret that. Just because the osmolar gap is normal or because the anion gap is normal shouldn't make you completely rule out the possibility of an ethylene glycol intoxication. So here are some of the crystals that you can see, the calcium oxalate crystals. Uh, crystalluria can actually persist for up to 40 hours or to, uh, from 40 hours to about four days after the uh, ingestion. Initially, within a few hours, you start to see the di di dihydrate crystals, and these are the ones that are envelope-shaped, as you can see here. Um, these crystals start to evolve over time, and after five to seven hours, you'll see actually a mixture of dihydrate and monohydrate crystals, and those are the ones that are needle-shaped or, or dumbbell-shaped, and after seven hours, only monohydrate crystals are seen. Um, urine fluorescence is actually a pretty poorly sensitive and specific test. Uh, it used to be that um, in the emergency room, you know, doctors would look at, look at the urine under a UV lamp and look for fluorescence. And this is because some brands of antifreeze actually contain sodium fluorescein, which, which fluoresces when you look at it with a Woods lamp. Um, the problem is that that's not the case with all brands of antifreeze. And also, there are other factors that can cause urine fluorescence. Certain foods and other medications that you ingest can also contribute to urine fluorescence as well as the urine pH. So um, it, it's really not a great test to, to, uh, to make the diagnosis. Before I go into the management, I'll just also briefly talk about methanol. So methanol is another toxic alcohol which is found in a, a variety of different uh, household and industrial solutions. Just like ethylene glycol, peak levels after ingestion occur quite quickly, within an hour. The difference is that with methanol, there's a, a latent period of about a day before the development of its toxic symptoms um, or be, before the development of the metabolic acidosis. Uh, its volume of distribution is about 0.6 to 0.7, similar to the distribution of water in the body. A good part of meth meth uh, methanol is metabolized by the liver, again by alcohol dehydrogenase, and a small percentage is excreted unchanged by the lungs. Again, here's that, these are the metabolic pathways. Alcohol dehydrogenase breaks methanol down into formaldehyde, which has been broken down to formic acid, and it's the formic acid which contributes to the metabolic acidosis and the formate which contributes to the toxicity of um, methanol poisoning. And formic acid is ultimately broken down into carbon dioxide and water. Some of the findings that you'll see in patients with a methanol intoxication include tachycardia, hypotension, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, uh, some neurological symptoms. Some visual symptoms are the ones that are more characteristic, so patients can develop hyperemic optic discs, papilledema, blindness is one of the more worrisome consequences of methanol intoxication. And as I was mentioning earlier, the patients with methanol intoxication are at risk for developing uh, necrosis of the putamen within, with hemorrhage and the development of, of, of a cerebral um, hemorrhage. So the treatment of ethylene glycol and methanol intoxication really rests on two main principles. The first is that you want to eliminate, um, you want to prevent the generation of the metabolites from these toxic alcohols because it's the metabolites which, exit, which cause the toxicity. And we can do this really with a couple different methods. So historically, uh, people used, uh, doc doctors used ethanol because ethanol could comp compete with the enzyme alcohol dehydrogenase. And sometimes you'll hear about stories about physicians who kept bot you know, bottles of Jack Daniels in their office uh, in case patients present in the, middle, you know, in the dead of night with this problem. But now we have a much more effective drug, which is fomepazole. Fomepazole is a competitive inhibitor of alcohol dehydrogenase and, and is about 500 times more competitive for alcohol dehydrogenase and ethylone, ethanol alone. The second principle is that you want to try to remove the alcohol and the toxic metabolites as quickly as possible. 
And the best way to do this is with hemodialysis, which, um, which again is very efficient at removing the metabolites and at the same time can help correct the metabolic and acid-base disturbances which can happen in, in these patients. In addition to these um, therapies, there's some supplemental therapies which may also be of benefit. Now, there have, haven't been any clinical studies to show that these are, 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 have changed clinical outcomes, but there's rationale for using these substances, and also they're generally harmless. So remember that um, ethylene glycol is also broken down into other substances, glycine and beta-ketoadipic uh, acid, and by giving patients thymine and pyridoxine, you help to shunt the metabolism of glycol the glycol the glyoxylic acid to these two uh, harmless substances. In the case of methanol poisoning, uh, you can give patients folate, and this helps to um, break down the, the, uh, the formaldehyde or the formic acid into CO2 and water. This just shows you the metabolic uh, pathways and the different steps at which these different therapies take place. Again, the ethanol and the fomepazole inhibit the alcohol dehydrogenase. Um, folate, pyr um, pyridoxine, and thymine help to shunt the uh, metabolism of these metabolites to less harmful substances. So this extra work group did, has recently issued recommendations on when to use hemodialysis in patients with methanol poisoning. They have not yet um, issued recommendations for ethylene glycol, but I suspect that those will be coming shortly. So. The extra work recommends hemodialysis in patients who present with severe methanol poisoning, and they define that as being patients who have coma, seizures, or, or new vision deficits on presentation, patients who have severe metabolic acidosis, or patients who have a very elevated serum anion gap greater than 24, or patients who have uh, very elevated serum methanol levels within the blood, and you can see the different thresholds that they have established based on whether or not patients are being concomitantly treated with fomepazole or ethanol. Um, or patients who have impaired kidney function. The extra uh, work group recommends using hemodialysis as opposed to uh, continuous renal replacement therapy. They recommend continuing the alcohol dehydrogenase antagonists from epazol or ethanol and the other supplemental therapies while hemodialysis is being um, continued and to stop hemodialysis when methanol is less than 200 milligrams per liter or when patients start to uh, improve clinically. Um, I didn't include a slide on the recommendations for ethylene glycol because, again, the, the recommendations are, are, are variable and none of them have been established. But similar uh, indications would go, would be, um, can be applied to patients with ethylene glycol intoxication. Patients who are clinically unstable in spite of supportive measures, patients with, a, um, with renal impairments, um, patients with severe acidemia or acidosis, or patients with an ethylene glycol level greater than 50. I won't be able to cover all the different toxic alcohols, so I've provided a table uh, for you here which shows the toxic metabolites for the different toxic alcohols and some of the uh, clinical abnormalities you might see. I do just want to bring your attention to isopropanol, and the reason for that is that isopropanol is a toxic alcohol that will generate, that in, when, when, in when ingested in high quantities, will generate an osmolar gap but it will not generate metabolic acidosis or an anion gap. And the reason for this is because the metabolite of isopropanol is acetone and not one of the acids that are generated by some of the other toxic alcohols. So just one thing to remember about isopropanol. So let's move along to salicylates. So salicylates um, you know, are the active ingredient in, in many, many pain preparations, such as aspirin. Uh, salicylates reach peak serum levels within an hour, unless you take the the delayed or enteric coated formulations, which can delay the peak serum levels. Salicylates are very heavily protein bound and not 90%. Um, this percentage of uh, salicylates that are protein bound, however, can decrease after an overdose. Salicylates are metabolized primarily by the liver and glycinated there to sal salicylic acid, which is a less toxic metabolite. The important thing to know about salicylates is that at toxic levels of salicylates, some of these protective mechanisms, um, such as the liver, uh, for instance, are overwhelmed, and this allows for more of the salicylates to reach different tissues and exert drug toxicity. So salicylate toxicity takes place because of the following reasons. So first is that salicylates go to the brain, and they can stimulate the medullary respiratory center. And this is what causes hyperventilation and the development of a respiratory alkalosis, which is really the first thing that you see in patients who overdose on salicylates. Salicylates will also uncouple oxidative phosphorylation in mitochondria, and this leads to the development of a metabolic acidosis, which is primarily a lactic acidosis. 
So initially, initially patients have the respiratory alkalosis, they then develop the metabolic acidosis, and oftentimes patients who present to the emergency room will have both when they present. There are patients who actually will present with a respiratory acidosis and metabolic acidosis, and these patients you have to be worried about the possibility of uh, respiratory fatigue, pulmonary edema, or, or uh, CNS depression in the case that a patient might have taken a mixed overdose with narcotics, for instance. So some of the clinical findings you may see in patients with salicylate poisoning, again, respiratory alkalosis, anion gap metabolic acidosis, patients may have nausea and vomiting, uh, tinnitus, deafness, vertigo, seizures, um, gastric symptoms, abnormal LFTs, hypoglycemia, and hypothermia. There's a bedside test to look for the presence of salicylates in the urine. It's called the Trinder spot test. I don't know if it, any of you have ever tried this in your careers. Um, it's not very commonly done, but just be aware of that this is another way to potentially detect the presence of salicylates. Uh, what you do is you take a milliliter of urine and you mix to that a milliliter of what's called the Trinder reagent, which is 10% iron chloride. And if the urine turns a purple color, this can indicate the presence of salicylic acid. This has about a 94% sensitivity uh, and a 74% specificity for detecting uh, salicylate concentrations greater than 30 milligrams per deciliter. The treatment of salicylate poisoning primarily, primarily supportive care. Uh, this is where GI decontamination is effective, so activated charcoal does bind to salicylates and should be used in patients who present to the emergency room with a suspected salicylate intoxication. Uh, patients should be given um, IV fluids for volume repletion. And again, as I mentioned earlier, salicylates are one of those drugs for which urinary alkalinization can be effective. Uh, salicylates are weak acids, and by giving patients urinary alkalinization, you can actually promote the urinary excretion of, of salicylates and prevent uh, salicylate entry into the central nervous system. The actual recommendations for salicylates poisoning Hemodialysis is recommended if the salicylate concentration is greater than 100 uh, or greater than 90 in the presence of impaired kidney function. It's also recommended for patients who have an altered mental status or present with respiratory compromise and hypoxemia. There's a weaker recommendation uh, that hemodialysis is suggested if standard treatment fails and you have elevated salicylate levels or the presence of severe metabolic acidosis. Intermittent hemodialysis is the preferred modality here, although you can consider uh, hemoperfusion or continuous therapies if uh, hemodialysis is not available, and stop hemodialysis when you see clinical improvement and when the salicylate levels have decreased to less than 19 uh, milligrams per deciliter. So now we move on to amphetamines, and the reason why I bring up amphetamines is because now amphetamines are the second most widely used recreational drugs behind cannabis. And we're talking specifically here about methamphetamines, which are sympathomimetic amines that belong to the class of phenylethylamines. These drugs are used clinically for the treatment of um, ADHD, narcolepsy, as well as um, obesity for some patients. But in more recent years, more, more recent years um, methamphetamines have been found to be easily synthesized in home labs from using over-the-counter cold preparations. So the effects of methamphetamines are due to the fact that methamphetamines um, work on neurons, and they basically are taken up by cytoplasmic vesicles of presynaptic neurons and displace neurotransmitters. So they'll displace epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin to the synapse, and these neurotransmitters will then bind to the postsynaptic neurons and activate the receptors. So activation of the alpha and beta adrenergic receptors with epinephrine and norepinephrine leads to the findings of hypertension, tachycardia, vasospasm, and hyperthermia. Stimulation of the dopamine receptors will lead to the drug craving, some of the psychiatric symptoms that these patients exhibit. And stimulation of the serotonin receptors will lead to the mood alterations and, and the abnormal response to hunger and thirst that these patients will have. So why would you get called for methamphetamine intoxication? Because these patients can have hypertension, and we may be called upon to help control that hypertension. What you want to remember here is that you don't want to treat these patients with beta blockers alone because of the fact that if you block the, the, uh, if you use beta blockers, you may lead to unopposed alpha stimulation by norepinephrine and epinephrine, and this can actually worsen the hypertension. You may get called for acute kidney injury, because some of these patients have been reported to uh, present with rhabdomyolysis or uh, impaired renal perfusion. You may get called to see patients who develop hyponatremia, 
as some of these patients, um, because after they take the medications, they often are very thirsty, so they'll have an excess water intake. Some of these patients have also been reported to develop SIADH. So just some of the indications that they might call you for um, in patients who've ingested methamphetamines. And the last agent I'll talk to you about is um, one that's been discovered in the last couple of years, and these are synthetic cannabinoids, otherwise known as spice. Now, just, add, just out of curiosity, you just raise, raise your hand if you've heard of spice or have seen patients who've ingested spice. So a pretty, pretty large, good number of, of physicians within the audience. So for those of you who haven't seen this before, so spice or synthetic cannabinoids are these designer drugs, um, which are typically dissolved in a solvent, applied to dry, uh, dried plant material, and then smoked. And since 2012, um, there have been about 16 cases, at least in this one publication, um, of acute kidney injury that's happened after exposure to these synthetic cannabinoids from six different states. These patients presented with nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, flank pain, relatively nonspecific symptoms. The median serum creatinine was actually quite high. These patients came in with uh, creatinines around seven. Urinalyses were variable. Some patients had pernuria, some casts, white blood cells, red blood cells. And a number of these pa patients actually had renal biopsies that were performed, and many of the patients showed evidence of acute tubular necrosis. There were a few, some patients that showed uh, interstitial nephritis. We have no antidote for this. The management is typically supportive uh, for these patients. Most of these patients will generally recover uh, within a few days, but some patients develop severe enough acute kidney injury to require hemodialysis. So with that, I'll conclude um, the talk about poisonings and intoxications. Again, I've included some, some questions for you to take a look at as self-assessment, and I'll be happy to answer any questions from you. Thank you for your time. Yes? So digoxin is moderately dialyzable. Um, so Extrip does have a recommendation for digoxin as well. And the recommendation is that most patients will not need digoxin if, if they're receiving the, um, the FAB treatment for it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so there is that, there is that concern, and I think you have to, um, I think that's why they generally tell you that you, you do, you have to adjust the dose of the Femepasol if, you are, if patients are being dialyzed, you, have, you do have to increase the dose given the concern about, about the possibility of uh, removing it through dialysis. And there are some recommendations on, on, on how to adjust the dose. Yes? So, uh, what's your typical dialysis dose for some of which I call it? How fast, what kind of so the question, your question was um, how to use dialysis for patients with ethylene glycol? What's your dialysis dose prescription for that? So how fast, what kind of dose, what's the dose? Yeah, so I think in these patients, you know, you, you certainly don't have to, you're not dialyzing these patients as if you're dialyzing a patient who's newly starting dialysis for ESRD. Generally speaking, um, use a standard, we'll use a standard F180 filter for these patients. Um, in terms of time, you generally want to dial these patients for longer, uh, usually three, four, or five hours. And um, we don't worry too much at the, initially about uh, the blood flow rate. I think we, the, the goal really is that you want to have the most efficient dialysis possible. So you want high blood flow rates um, to try to improve the efficiency of removal. Yes? Is the approach different? For patients that are chronically on lithium getting intoxicated or patients that are intoxicated not being it's a good question. So the question is, do you, is your approach different um, depending on if the patient's been on lithium before? And the concern if patients have been on lithium before is that they have built up these restores of lithium within their body. And that you have to be concerned about that even if you remove or lower levels through, you know, alkalinization or through, um, or not through dialysis, but through forced diuresis or through uh, dialysis and so forth, you have to be worried about the rebound. And so I think in these patients who, who've been on chronic lithium, you just need to make sure that you're watching them carefully, even after you dialyze them, in case that the, they re-equilibrate and their lithium stores are now mobilized back into the serum and the lithium levels go back up again.